just tell us a story, all right? One, hun one highlight in your life since you have accepted that being gay and a Christian is not an oxymoron. So just introduce yourself that way. Okay. Oh, okay. Me first or me? Um, you go first. Me, me first, yeah. okay. So I'm Paul, um, <laughs> and uh, it's great, great to be here. Um, a number of things have happened over the last year. I, I only came out or was outed um, by my wife and son, and I deserved it about 15 months ago, so pretty recent. And um, uh, a number of things have happened, but the story I wanted to tell you, I've told very, very few people indeed, but I just thought it would be good, good to say tonight. Um, and, and you know, when that happens, you do question your faith, question your theology. I did, I did a theology degree, um, but everything's sort of up in the air, and it was for me, and for the only time in my life, ever, um, a week after it all happened, I contemplated suicide, stood on the edge of Wandsworth Station and was going to throw myself under a train. And then I really felt God, God speaking to me. I didn't do that, but I came that close. But um, very, very shortly after that, like literally within a couple of weeks, um, I was di diagnosed with um, quite a rare form of cancer. There's only, only around 3,000 people a year in the UK get that. And um, I'd, um, I'd had one appointment, and I, I was due in for another one, so I had an appointment. and. Um, to keep the story short, um, I've never experienced um, physical healing through prayer in my life. I have prayed for other people and I've seen it in different situations within the church with friends. But um, uh, literally I had a, a growth on my foot. Um, it, it grew uh, over, over several weeks, quite fast. I was under the Royal Marsden under a you know, senior surgeon there in the team. and. Um, but um, some Christian friends at that time who um, I'd been sharing with what, what was going on, Christians who did stand with me, said, we're going to pray about this and we're going to pray for God's healing. And I didn't have the faith for that or the belief for that, really, to be honest. I think it's easier to pray for other people than it is to pray for yourself so often. And, and, and that was where I was. But, but anyway, they, they prayed for me and, um, and slowly, and, and I was told this lump will get bigger and they're going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to go for surgery and they need to, to cut it out. And... Um, so anyway, the people start praying and the thing starts to go down. And, um, and bear in mind it was diagnosed, so it's a rare form, I can give you the Latin name and, and everything else. There's not a lot of understanding of it because it's quite a small continuum of the population, get it, but, but relatively serious and can go to other organs and things. So, um, uh, but anyway, I was due to go in for surgery in January, um, towards the end of January. And um, so people were praying and this thing got smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually it ended up, it was just a pinprick on my foot. Um, and you know, from this size right down, you could hardly see it. But anyway, I end up in the Royal Marsden. Um, my son was there with me to, 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 to stand with me during that time. Tough time for him because I'd only just come out as gay uh, three or four months before. And um, I'm in there in the morning, I put the gown on. They gave me one of these injections to sort of relax you. And I'm upstairs in the ward waiting. They do blood pressure and all the stuff they do. And then the guys come along and wheel me. I have to lay on this gurney. And they wheel me down to the lift, take me down to the basement. And, um, and, I, and I go into this room. And through the double doors, I threw three doctors in green gear and their masks and everything. And the surgeon, surgeon guy, the top guy, you know, they're very arrogant, these guys, aren't they? Sometimes, you know, surgeons. And, uh, and he comes up to me. I'd met him two or three times. And and um, he said to me, well, let's just have a look before we take you in. And um, he said, we're going we're gonna, to um, anaesthetise the foot. You know, we've relaxed you. And, and the anaesthetist was sitting there as well. And um, so he pulls back the cloth and he looks and he says, hmm. He says, what's happened here? So <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure really. But I said, I'm a Christian and a load of friends have been praying for me. It's just been going down and down and down. I, I don't think you can see it, can you? I said, I think that's it, isn't it? That little prick there. So we've got the photographs and things. He said, um, you're the right person, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and he said, uh, so he said, um, he looked at me and he said, um, so what do you want me to do? <laughs> and I just cracked up with laughter because I said, I said to him, you're the expert, not me. I know nothing about this. I said, what do you want to do? So he said, brought you all the way down here. I suppose I'll take you in. He said, this is going to take 30 seconds. He said, I'll just make sure that little pinprick's out. And he said, come on, we'll go in. So he said, there's no point anaesthetizing it or anything. He said, push the guy away with the, uh, you know, the thing that was going to do that. Because they had the thing in my arm and everything to connect to. And um, they wheeled me in. I was totally awake. And he just sort of fiddled around with a little knife. Hardly felt anything like a pinprick. And put an elastoplast on and wheeled me out. And um, so that, you know, that has gone. And, and that was it. But I, it is a funny story. But it's quite an incredible story. For me, I was in tears. 
afterwards. Um, but for me, it, it, it emphasised, I believe, you know, for me, that God loved me so much. And he was going to do something so special at that moment in my life when I felt, you know, what is this all about? What have I done? I feel so guilty working all that through. Um, and I hold on to that story. I tell that story only to close friends, but the first time I told it to a number of people tonight, but it's a really special moment. And it reminds me constantly that God loves me as a person and you know, I'm really special to him. And uh, I matter to him so much that he would go and do something like that. That's my story. Thank you. Over to you. Over to you. Sorry. <coughs> Bef before you had that beautiful outcome of the story, when you obviously got the diagnosis of cancer and you just came out. Yeah. That didn't feel that great, didn't it? Uh, what, they're coming out? No, obviously having that diagnosis after oh, you've no, just that come was out. Even worse. Then, exactly. Oh, no, yeah, that was even worse. <clears throat> Absolutely. Did you doubt your step I, coming out? Do you know out what I point? thought? I thought this is my punishment from God. That's what I, re that's what I honestly thought. thought. And um, there was one Christian leader who um, sort of kind of suggested that. There was some kind of punishment that God was now going to put on me for what I'd done. Um, although what I'd been doing, I'd been doing for some years before that. So, so that's what I felt. So, yeah, it was a double whammy, Lucas, you're right. It was, yeah, yeah. Um, but God turned it around, mm. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. My name is Lucas. <coughs> I'm 41. I'm from Switzerland. So if you have troubles understanding me, I do apologise. <coughs> um, I came out as gay after a long, long, long struggle um, when I was 26 to my family. And when I came out, so the question is obviously what was the positive about it, yeah? Coming yeah. out, yeah. Yeah, the highlight in your life since you've been oh, no. Yeah. Mm. I just go and get the corner. When I came out to my parents, um, my parents told me not to tell my grandparents and my grandmother. My grandparents were very Christians, but just this beautiful in love old couple and my grandma didn't really bother about church at all. <clears throat> for about 10 years, I kept that promise until I really realized it was um, it was getting more and more difficult because it, being gay affects my whole life. So when I go and see them from London back to Switzerland and make a visit like three or four times a year, you struggle, you know, you can't talk about girlfriends and, you know, who do you fancy and all that stuff. And, and you just, uh, yeah. And that affected my 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 really loving and intimate uh, relationship to my to my um, grandparents and grandma and at some point I told my mom listen after 10 years I'm coming to the point where I think you had 10 years of my promise and I think that's enough I feel it really affects me I love them dearly but I think it's just it's just it's just stupid um, <clears throat> but inside me as I said like when the moment comes and when I feel it's right I will tell them but inside me, I was obviously praying, going like, God, I don't really want to break that promise, but, you know, please just take care of it. Um, so I went, it was middle of January, I went to visit my grandma when I was in Switzerland, and we had a lovely chat, and after that, when I get up and want to say goodbye to her, she took my hand and said, take a seat, Lucas. Mm. And I took another seat in front of the window next to her orchids and her little, you know, wooden birds <laughs> and all that, where she would just look out of the window, and she said, are you gay? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, <coughs> um, yes. And she said, I thought so. <laughs> and um, she then just made the most incredible statement. Obviously, we, you know, emotionally a bit shaken and stuff like this, but she said, don't you ever let anyone tell you that is not right. Mm. I want you to be happy. I want you to live your life. The world would be such a poorer and less colorful place and less fun place with all of you in there. Mm. All the painters and dancers and mm. actors and mm. all that, you know, all that. So she, she, mm. she drew from that kind of like experience of what she knew about the topic. Mm. Uh, and she was like 89 at that, at that time. Now she's turning, now she's turning 95 this um, next month. And she just said like, because of you, the world has so much more beauty mm. and color and richness and, and word and song and all that. And then she said, a um, couple of weeks ago, there was a young guy, mid-twenties, buried in the village, in the church. And it was a strange announcement of death in the newspaper. And she said, like, maybe he was someone who had a secret that he felt he couldn't share with anyone 
and that was what he thought the only solution to come out or the only, the only way out and she said like you make sure that's not going to happen to you I'm backing you up all the way and obviously she wanted then to ask Do you know how my parents would feel about it they were struggling with it <coughs> and um, as soon as I left she grabbed the phone and wanted to speak to my dad and told him off like anything <laughs> she was like how dare you you going to church and you're preaching to me trying to go to church and all that so she was like it was just hilarious and since then that it's not very much connected with my faith in a way but yes it is because she has just been the most incredible woman in my life now since in the last years and before already she had a very very out of the norm life. She felt to the biggest part of her life like the absolute outsider, the absolute like I'm not part of that and just like I have a rubbish life and this is not fair and all that and it and through that we became so close as like blood brothers in a way. And my partner, she's taken my partner in as if he would be her only son, her, her own son which is amazing. Um, it's brought us so, so close together. And for me, it's just beautiful to see and to know I've got such a special connection to her mm -hmm. through that. Yes, she's not, she not a believer. She doesn't believe in Jesus, but she is, mm. she's getting there. Mm -hmm. Maybe for 110. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's just been one of the special things that motivated me to stand up and to be courageous. Mm. And as well, just baffled me a little bit to see people that I would not expect would stand up so strong and so firm and so convinced and just make a stand and shelter us. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. So the next question is nice hearing these anecdotes and these stories. Both of you have mentioned about the church and quite rightly really the LGBT community is quite suspicious mm. of the church and of Christians as well. And all they have seen is the negative things in the church. Given all the, I'm reading this, given all the horrible rhetoric that has been aimed at the LGBTI community, and in that sense at both of you personally, mm. by Christians and Christian leaders, what is it about Christianity itself that's so compelling that you haven't been turned off completely by so many of its messengers? Now, I'm going to give you Four minutes each. Okay. You've got to give them, right? Four minutes each. Because like most gay men, they love the sound of their voice. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk real fast. So um, one, one of the worst things that happened to me was a mentor of 30 years, Christian leader, who when I told him, he sent an email to me with this obscure bit from the uh, King James Version saying I was going to go to hell and I needed to change my mind. You know, it was horrendous. I'm sure all of us have, have had that sort of thing. But um, the things for me were I met the three wise men. And God introduced me to the three wise men. One of them is Dave Morton, one is Jeremy over there, and the other one was Steve Chalk. Steve Chalk was first, I knew Steve. But really, uh, people who knew uh, what they were talking about over many years. And, um, you know, I'd never met Dave and Jeremy before I knew Steve going back. But the three wise men were really helpful in terms of their own experience, helping me with my theology, because I had a very traditional evangelical theological degree. So um, I thank God for those men who came into my life and have become friends. Um, that, that have helped me. And, and the other thing was, um, having been a Christian for uh, nearly 40 years, um, understanding the love of God, and from a theological point of view, understanding that, yes, God does love us unconditionally, that the church is supposed to be an expression of God's love, that was quite hard to sort of put aside, even with some of the nasty vitriol that I had from some Christians, not all, lots of people were really supportive. But, but, but there was that. And then the third thing, I'm just looking at my, uh, the three wise men, Forty. Um, oh yeah, and, and I did a whole load of reading, Dave. And um, I, I was fortunate to be away uh, two months in, in the first six months of the, that, that time in the States. It was all planned at holidays that I was supposed to have and my wife didn't go because we'd split, but I went. And I did loads and loads of reading and somebody said that I'd probably done enough to get a PhD, but I just read every Christian leader I could find and people outside the church and their thinking on LGBT and realized there were a lot of uh, good leaders. Um, Steve introduced me to Tony Campolo. I sat here with him for an hour and a half when he was in London. Fantastic time, very funny man, but obviously very, very on the ball theolo theologically. And I needed to get my mind straight. Um, and so being having the time to do that and meeting people who told me, why well, have you read this guy? Have you read that book? 
that really helped me understand actually what God's perspective was. Um, so I sort of wobbled. Um, I realised actually there's some amazing and an increasing number of amazing uh, leaders and people that I was beginning to respect and get to know who um, said this is bunkum really and God loves us all unconditionally and um, you know you're, you're like a four-leaf clover that's my thing I see a four-leaf clover and um, you know God said you're like the four-leaf clover you're actually the special clover you're the most beautiful one yeah you know I created you in that way because you know everything I created is, 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 is unique and special and everything else and you are special and, and gave me that vision of that and um, through my understanding I realised a bit like Lucas said and what your grandmother said you know about what LGBT people often bring into the world um, because of certain traits and DNA um, I began to understand that so it kind of kept me on course really and, uh, and obviously finding a church that I just absolutely love without promoting Oasis because lots of you are not part of Oasis but you know fantastic church where the unconditional love of God is expressed you know in reality and practically you know through people that you meet and um, so that that's really helped me and, I, and I've kind of held on to it is that four minutes yet Okay. Oh, you've still got another 45 seconds. <laughs> oh, I haven't. Oh, no. Well, there you go, C. Dave. I'm not, oh, I'm not wow. like that. Oh, well, yeah, no, yeah, I better hand over to you, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> Before we hand over to Lucas, any questions you'd like to ask? Now, you said you'd been a Christian 40 years. 40 years, yeah. So how old are you now, then? Oh, gosh. <laughs> you, I knew you'd say that. I'm 61. So, uh, yeah, so you, you can work that don't out. Don't look it. Oh, thank you, Dave. You did once. I know. Um, it's really lovely, isn't it? Eh? It's lovely. Right, any questions you'd like to ask him about his story? Well, it, it was what we call the club of verses. There are three verses in the Bible that I didn't even know because I just accepted the traditional view that, you know, gay is wrong and there's these six verses. Ridiculous for a theological student who, but I never even studied it or understood there was a totally different interpretation. Six verses, you know, and when you actually read into it and understand the background and everything, you realise this is just bunkum, really. But that, that, that was it. And so I had to get my head around that and there's some great teaching from a lot of really good leaders now an increasing number of leaders you know and theologians here in the states and elsewhere who and over here who um, you know can explain that quite clearly and um, but you know stupidly I never got you know I never I never really looked at it. I just assumed I was living I was living a double life and in some way it was wrong um, yeah but it was that for me it's funny isn't it especially for those here that come from the evangelical conservative background if you're at university, if you're at school, college, or a business person, you question everything mm. except your faith. Yeah. Yeah. You accept what the leaders have said. Mm. You accept what your branch of the church states. Yet you wouldn't do that in business. No. You wouldn't do that in your job. Mm. But we do in the church. We mm. just accept it. Mm. Mm. Especially people within the conservative evangelical mm. stuff. Mm. Mm. Um... <coughs> I was a very shy child, very insecure, um, quite strange, I think, very to myself in the you know school courtyard and all that. Um, and quite soon, probably like so from ten onwards or something, I, I separate my, separated myself a little bit more, even because I think I've realised that I'm a bit different and a bit strange, and. Um, <clears throat> that was weird and that was strange and that was difficult in, in, in many, many, you know, human ways. What it had positive about it was, because I went to Sunday school and, you know, Jesus, I invited Jesus when I was three or four years old, listening to one of these children tapes of, about the Bible story. And I said, like, yeah, I want to have you as my best friend. And I think that's what I've practiced then, prax practiced. Um, I've talked with him about everything because I didn't really have that one best friend or that group of friends where I would just hang out and talk about everything. So it was just Jesus that I was chatting to. Mm. And I think that helped me really when I, in my teenage years, then really struggled to struggle a lot. Like really, like, I guess then you wouldn't really diagnose it, but I guess these days I would probably be on medications for depression and all that. But like in the, <clears throat> in the 80s, it wouldn't really, you know, mental health wasn't really a topic at all. So, I had my social outbreaks where the shutters would just go down as soon as there was a group setting and it got a bit funny and people were laughing, I just had to leave. And I went out and basically just got out everything that 
was bothering me. And every time when I was lost for words, when I had no words left, I was out in the nature and somehow that peace, that quietness, that still small voice was just there saying like, it's okay, I'm here mm. and I love you. Mm. It's okay, we'll get through it day by day, step by step. Mm. And I think that period, like in my teenage years, between like 14, probably like even like 18, something like this up to that, helped me really to build my, not just Sunday school based faith, but individual faith with Jesus. He became my best friend. He became the one I talked to. Mm. I'm probably out of time, right? Okay. Mm. Um, and that helped, helped, helped to just separate the God that loves me and the institution church, which mm. is a human institution. Yes, with a divine task to, you know, to be representatives on earth, but it's a human institution. We all disappoint. We will all hurt each other again, whether we do it on purpose or not on purpose, but it just happens. That's just how it is. Get over it. Mm. And that we all probably know that that separation is probably one of the most valuable uh, things that you can get aware of in your life, just to not pour out the baby with the bath water, but actually realize God is not equal to church necessarily. And that helped me, for example, when years later, my church leader team came to me and said, I was a worship leader and said, um, um, we just think it would be good to pray and, you know, cast out some demons of you. You know, we just want to see whether, you know, there is some around there. And I think that can very be traumatic for many, many people. But I laid there, we went into the little room and I went there on the table, laid there. And inside me I was praying, I was calm and praying. Okay, well, if there is a demon in me about homosexuality, well, then get it out. Of course, I don't want that. But if there is not, it shall not define, that experience here shall not define me. Mm. Because I know that you love me and I know that you are God. Whatever struggles I have ahead of me. So I guess for me, really, of course, what, what Paul said as well, it's... Um, there were loads of struggles ahead of me then in churches and you know as soon as you have a partner a boyfriend then you know you can't be a leader anymore <coughs> otherwise and then coming to this church yes really has helped me as well i think i have just planted my little plant into a mm. fertile ground where i can flourish and where i can where i can bloom where suddenly like you can you can be active again where you can participate where you can help and it's 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 appreciated where we can grow and mm. talk about and encourage each other and that is just mm. purpose isn't it mm.